great. Let's grab a good crowd. All right, we're good. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a great turnout for a Friday morning in late June. Uh, I think the fact that we have so many people here uh, testifies to the reputation of our guests today. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest in them and, and what they have to say. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Lester Grau and Charles Bartles from the Foreign Military Studies Office uh, at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, Dr. Grau has uh, been with the U.S. Army for 51 years uh, and has authored 15 books and 250 articles in that time. So he's been very productive. He's an expert uh, on the Soviet war in Afghanistan um, and, as we're going to hear about today, uh, Russian conventional forces. Uh, to his left, uh, Charles Bartol is an analyst uh, and linguist at the Foreign Military Studies Office uh, who focuses on Russian and Central Asian military force structure, modernization, tactics, uh, and similar issues. Um, to my far left, we have uh, Mike Kaufman from the Center for Naval Analysis, who's going to be our discussant today. Um, Les and Chuck are going to uh, give a presentation for somewhere around 30, 45 minutes. Um, then Mike is going to make some framing points, uh, and then we will open it up to discussion. Uh, we are recording, so we are on the record. Uh, there should be a video uh, posted at some point, probably next week. Um, in the meantime, please silence your cell phones and other noise-making devices. Uh, and if there are no objections, I will turn the floor over to our guests. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for your kind invitation, the CNA's kind invitation to come out here. Um, it's so nice to get away from the flooding. Um, it's, uh, Fort Leavenworth's uh, airport's been underwater now for two months, so we're fortunately Kansas City is, is still in business, but it's uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun out there. Um, we work for a, a funny little place called the Foreign Military Studies Office. We're basically linguists, and we del deal exclusively in open source. So I don't have the great secrets, I have what they say. And um, basically, uh, it's more than enough to keep, uh, to keep you busy, so. Um, but what we'd like to do today is talk about uh, Russian force structure for large-scale combat operations. When we had this thing called the Soviet Union, they had some 210, 211 motorized rifle and tank divisions 17 artillery divisions, 8 airborne divisions, 4 air defense divisions, and 8 rear support divisions. Wow. Now, they weren't all full. There were mobilization divisions. They were waiting for the big one, and they were going to mobilize. So, um, and what we're looking at today is certainly not 210 divisions. It's a different army, it's a different time. Uh, you have a military that is uh, heirs to the old system. Uh, you, have a mil you have three militaries, basically, within uh, Russia. The forces of the Ministry of Defense, the forces of internal security, and the forces of the FSB. Uh, in the past, you have had separate uh, militarized intelligence services. These uh, were more of an anti-coup device back in the old days. Today, they, have, they, are, they are merging more. They are becoming more, uh, more trusted, I guess. But um, basically, what do you need a military for in Russia? And this spans a, a large large gap from soccer riots and local unrest to color revolutions to uh, border conflicts to local wars to breakaway secessionist uh, movements uh, and now considering conventional maneuver war <coughs> under nuclear threatened conditions. Uh, a return to the old days, and this is something that they have been looking at 
under their new force structure and trying to figure out how they're going to get on top of it. And in fact, and you'll talk more about the National Guard recently, they've recently uh, stood up a 200 to 300,000 man National Guard, which looks nothing like our National Guard. They are basically a militarized police force for internal security. Uh, think of the highway patrol with artillery. And uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, there's been a, a great shakeup in <coughs> the uh, military force structure. They have had the biggest uh, military reform in the past century. Um, and basically, what they have done, they've started from the top down. They have truncated military districts back to four, now coming back to five. But military districts used to be primarily an administrative tool that would handle things like conscription and uh, depot management and uh, getting, providing forces. But the general staff would do the command of the forces that were located in the various military districts. Under the new system, this has changed. The military districts now control the Army, Air Force, Air Defense Forces, Naval Forces, should they be in their district. And so they are basically also a wartime headquarters. Uh, in the old days, they had fronts and army groups as large uh, uh, forces. Uh, they've been calling the front a historical term, but we're seeing indications that the front may come back into the vocabulary here in the future. Uh, but basically, bringing the commands under the military districts uh, are their version of the Goldwater Nichols. Uh, because they've done something else with the military districts. If they've made them operational strategic commands. And so they're in charge, they're calling the shots. And so your district commander has a far more significant role than in the past. In the restructuring of the force structure, they have gone from a, uh, a force of army groups, divisions, and regiments, to now you have Joint Strategic Command, you have army groups, and you have brigades. Why brigades? Brigades are a lot more mobile. They're a lot more flexible. You have the largest land border in the world. And how do you cover it? And what you do it with is uh, f mobile, flexible forces. Now you've seen something probably that they brought back a couple of divisions. And why would you bring back divisions? Divisions have more combat power. The, uh, if you dig them in on a defense, they're very tough to get through. But they're also beastly to move about any, any uh, length of time. And brigades are far more mobile. Every year, what they uh, the maneuver brigades have a snap exercise, quick notice exercise, and they pick up and they move uh, about a thousand kilometers to a training area they haven't been at before to work out. Now, since you have folks who serve much longer with their units and commanders who command longer with their units, what this gives them is a cadre of people who know how to do a unit long range unit movement. And from my military career, I only did two unit moves by rail. They were both disasters. It was a learning experience both times. But this is one of the things they're hoping to get there. But uh, the brigades, they're, they're smaller, they're lethal, but uh, uh, this seems to be the primary force. You put divisions on those paths, on the areas where 
you not might need that extra punch, that extra power, that extra place to change. Um, basically, in the reorganization of the armed forces, the Soviet Union used to have the world's largest air force. Russia has the fifth largest air force. Airframes are expensive, and when you don't have all the money in the world, um, maintaining a large air force is, uh, is tough. What they have done is combine the strategic air defense forces, air forces, uh, and space forces into what they call the aerospace forces. Uh, the primary force in, in the Russian army is the ground forces. Uh, Navy pretty much organized the way they were before. Chuck, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, so, so getting in how this is different, uh, a kind of different way of looking at this is, uh, you know, we're thinking about how the Russians fight right now, and you hear about that, and people talk about battalion tactical groups. When we're talking about large-scale combat operations, you know, you need, you need to be on a different scale. So we're not talking about battalions, or that's not what the Russians are thinking about. You know, battalions is that base unit of, of tactical maneuver, but in order to win, you have to think operationally. And when it comes to thinking operationally, you know, combat needs to be conducted with, you know, think on the level of armies and military districts, or or joint strategic commands. That's kind of the, the way the, uh, uh, the Russians are thinking. So uh, if you look at the diagram up here, you can kind of see the, the two main blocks we have, have outlined is the, is the joint strategic commands or the military districts. Those are kind of one and the same. When we talk about military district, it's usually you know, that geographical area in relation to uh, you know, how they're doing conscription or the more mundane rear services. And we talk about uh, joint uh, strategic commands, we're talking about you know, the, the commander's operational control of troops. It's, a, it's the same commander, but he has two different hats that he wears. It's two different things. And, uh, you know, kind of the base unit for, uh, for joint maneuver for the Russians is the, is the combined arms army. And you'll see that red box, that lower red box. And this is a very different system that we have in the United States. You know, in the U.S. system, you know, we have a combatant commander, and, uh, you know, he can, he can designate a joint task force, and he can come out of an army headquarters, Navy headquarters, Air Force headquarters, Marine headquarters. The Russians aren't set up like that. The, uh, if the Russians are going to set up a, uh, a joint task force headquarters, something similar. They're going to set up on one of these army groups. They just don't have the staff in the, in the air defense or the Navy to do that. So their, their joint capabilities are kind of wrapped around these uh, army group headquarters. What should we talk about? Hey, you, yeah, okay. You're, you're All right, so uh, looking at the... Uh, kind of the, the outlay of the, uh, of the Russian military districts. When they, when they went to this new military district system, you know, they broke down into four military districts, and then they stood up a new one, uh, the Northern Joint Strategic Command, I think in 2015, mm -hmm. and uh, either December 2014, or right around uh, 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're doing the operational command and control of their force, and you kind of see how the, the forces are arrayed. And just want to talk a little bit about this Northern Joint Strategic Command. It is pretty significant. Um, it has a very different structure than the rest of these uh, Joint Strategic Commands. They have uh, their headquarters, their Joint Strategic Command headquarters is just based on the Northern Fleet headquarters. So when they decided to stand up another big headquarters, instead of going out there and grabbing all these assets and, and putting in all these staff officers together and making a, a huge hierarchy, you know, huge military hierarchy, putting out there, they decided just to go and uh, just to augment an existing headquarters. And the intent of this is to have, you know, the operational command and control of the forces that's necessary, but not to have all that extra overhead from extra staff and extra general officers. So that was kind of the intent. And uh, we see the Russians are very interested in making new military districts, you know, dividing up some of the um, uh, military districts to have them smaller areas so they can provide that better command and control and we predict they may ha uh, utilize the same, uh, use the same method of, uh, of command and controls because it gives that, that ability to provide that operational command and control without having the extra overhead. You talk about like Russian disposition of military forces. You know, if you look at a map of, of Russian military forces, you know, you just see assets spread all over the map. But if you look at where these, uh, army group dispositions are, you can kind of see how they're kind of arrayed against the, th or where they perceive as the potential areas of threat. Obviously against uh, NATO to the west, 
and to the south against China, the North Korean border. So, um, you know, when you look at you know, when you look at this map, you really get an idea of of how the uh, Russians are kind of perceiving that that threat to them. That's where they're putting their military assets. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the army group structure. And uh, interestingly, the, the Russians have army groups and army corps in their system. Let's go back one slide. Uh, they have, I think, about 12 combined armed armies and uh, four army corps. Uh, you know, you talk to American person. You know, you talk to U.S. servicemen. You talk, you know, talk about an army and a corps. You know, they'll say that the corps is automatically subordinated to the army. It, it's not that way in the Russian system. Just as the uh, divisions are, or brigades aren't subordinated to divisions in the Russian system, army corps are not subordinated to uh, combined arms armies. The the way the Russians uh, kind of see it is that the uh, the army corps are all on maritime salience and all subordinated to fleet headquarters. So. Uh, basically, the, the command and control of the, the fleet's ground forces is, is controlled by this asset. And the, the Army Corps and the Combined Arms Armies are pretty much, um, even though they have different names, they pretty much provide the exact same capabilities. And it's that uh, way of providing like a joint command and control element for that, um, for that ground force. You're kind of looking here at like the, the standard structure, most of these. Uh, you know, most 11 combined arms armies and tank armies have, a, have they all have different structures, but this is kind of the baseline structure that the, uh, the Russians are going to right now. And they're trying to give um, all of their combined arms armies this kind of assets. And, and, with, uh, and you kind of see how it's organized. Do I see anything you want to say about that? I'll, I'll pick up later. <laughs> okay. And uh, so this is kind of, if they're going to war, this is a structure that, uh, that they that they use this you know the, the large scale structure and uh, interestingly you know we, we think of like a, a core level commander in the US or a joint task force commander we think of like a three or four star officer and uh, these army groups are usually commanded by a one or two star general so you know the, the ranks a lot lower and uh, so it's a, it's a very different ass uh, very different way of doing things and so this is kind of the baseline structure but you know in a in a go to war fitting you can definitely we can probably assume that they're going to add, going to do some additions, they're going to have some attachments to this. We'll talk a little about what those attachments look like. Um, based on Russia's previous actions and, and recent military conflicts, and actually, you know, even during the Soviet times, typically when uh, the Russian, when the Russians or the Soviets go to war, they typically designate a, a, a command, and then they'll attach these other, you know, other military units from other militarized intelligence services will be attached to that, that command. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea here of the, of the different um, commands that could be attached and the different units that could be attached to that, um, uh, to that uh, army group. And also significant is um, uh, another significant difference between uh, the, uh, the way that they fight is in the, in the U.S. system, we have a combatant commander, and the combatant commander will typically have his assets, and he'll push those down to, a, uh, to the Joint Task Force. In the Russian system, it looks like they're, they, the actual the Joint Strategic Command commander actually has assets which he, or she, which he controls, and he fights those assets. And this is kind of in line with the way the Russians kind of see the, the nature of future warfare. You know, they just don't see a, a large-scale conflict as happening on the borders of, of uh, you know, on the borders of the country. You know, there may be a you know, large scale conflict happening on the borders, but there could be you know, maybe hostile information operations happening in the rear, you know, stirring up dissent in the rear. And uh, uh, basically the Russians believe they need to have a, a mechanism for command and control to have uh, control of the whole depth of the defense. You know, so the whole, mil or the whole military district needs to have uh, military assets pro uh, provided there that can be command and controlled in case there's some sort of uh, insurgency in the rear or special operations, you know, they need to have that different structure. So the military district commander, the operation, the joint strategic command commander is also fighting that fight. Did you come forward to it? Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, this one right here. Uh, what is future war going to look like? And I think that is one of the things that is driving this. Um, we all are familiar with World War II and uh, continuous defensive lines and 
uh, building up great forces to smash through defensive lines. And as Russia looks at future war, they don't see a repeat of World War II. They talk about something called the Nachagabui battlefield, the fragmented battlefield, where you are going to fight with uh, open flanks, and you're going to protect your flanks with artillery, with uh, blocking positions, with counterattacks, but you are going, but it's not going to be this large continuum of uh, forces linked up mass to mass and pushing forward. And you are going to be fighting at several depths during this time. And if you notice where the armies are positioned here, where is your main threat? And historically, the threat to Russia has come from the west and from the south. And this is where they have most of their concern and the bulk of their forces. And then, of course, they have the large problem of China. And what do you do about that? Uh, looking back at their, who are their military theorists that are in favor? Well, we've got to go back a little ways, but in the 1920s, 1930s, there was a great debate in the Soviet Union between two schools of uh, strategic thought. One was led by Mar Mar Marshal Tukhachevsky, and Tukhachevsky's thought was, you don't want to let the other guy visit the destruction of war on the motherland. So if you're attacked, the response is to have a prompt, massive counterstrike against the enemy to visit the destruction of war on his homeland. And the other thought was led by General Svechin. And Svechin said, look, we're a, we're a big country. We don't have a lot of our big cities on the borders. Our terrain that we're probably going to fight on is, is rolling plains, mighty rivers, swamps, forest, and it's an absolute beast to get anywhere during the spring thaw uh, or in the autumn rains. So what we want to do is draw the enemy within the depths of the motherland where he stretches his supply lines, reaches his culminating point, and then strike him. And Tukhachevsky won the debate. Neither one of them survived to see World War II due to the Stalinist purges. Um, and when World War II starts, uh, Germany invades Poland, the Soviet Union invades Poland, they move their defensive lines from prepared defenses to the interior of Poland. Germany attacks, and the response is counter strikes. And they are weak, they are feeble, they don't work. So the next thing is strong forward defense. And they darn near lose the war at that point, and only through the grace of the stubbornness of the Russian people and Mother Winter do they manage to survive. The other problem they're going to face is reserves, and they're trying to put their reserve system together again. But right now, how do you do, Svechin's the favorite theorist today, mm -hmm. but how do you do that type of thing and win the, during the initial period of war? Because until you've got your reserve system in hand, uh, you've got a problem. You're, you're on again. Yeah, and kind of talk a little bit about, you know, if they fight, what's that going to look like? Uh, you know, let's talk a little bit how they had these militarized intelligence security services, and they, they've recently did a big reform where they've, they've taken a lot of these internal, ser internal security services, and they kind of wrapped them into this uh, Russian National Guard. And kind of the, the cornerstone or the, the primary element in this uh, Russian National Guard is the Russian Ministry of Interior Troops, the military voice uh, soldiers. So probably talking about maybe two or three hundred thousand uniform personnel and this is important because if you if you talk about uh, how big the Russian armed forces are you know m most estimates of the of the uh, of the Russian Ministry of Defense has maybe about approximately 850,000 uh, servicemen give or take and uh, you know, that's a pretty good chunk of people but uh, you know a lot of people don't consider 
the National Guard as how, how they're going to augment the fight if, if, the, uh, if the Russian Federation goes to war. And two or 300,000 people, that's a lot of people under arms that can, be, that can be brought into the fight. And they probably won't be brought in in terms of, you know, they aren't going to attach all 300,000 of those soldiers to the Ministry of Defense. You know, they have their own uh, district system. The National Guard has its own district system in the uh, Russian Federation. And they're actually the military, the National Guard districts are different than the military districts. There's like seven or eight uh, National Guard districts, but they are congruent with the military, with the uh, MOD districts. So they, they fall within those military districts. None of them cross a border line there. So I believe the intent there is that, uh, you know, they'll hand off some of those units, some of the more higher readiness units. Uh, some of those units actually have uh, infantry fighting vehicles and armored, you know, almost all of them have armored personnel carriers. So, you know, they're, if you saw them on the street, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them and a Ministry of Defense unit. You know, they have artillery systems, so you know it's a pretty big force multiplier that they're going to have. And not only are these guys, you know, some of these forces are going to be out there fighting on the front lines, but also going to be doing that rear security mission, which is uh, you know rear air security, you know, uh, securing the rear lines of communication. It takes a lot of forces, takes a lot of manpower, and uh, you know the Russian MOD forces will be able to put their combat troops up towards the front and have these. Uh, these military forces kind of in the rear doing that mission. So that's also a big uh, force multiplier. Mm -hmm. And let's see, Matt, anything else you want to say on us? Oh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about... Uh, go ahead. Let's, no, go ahead. When do we talk about? Uh, you know, kind of the, the relevance of, of why this is important. You know, in, in, the, uh, in the U.S. Army, you know, we still have pretty much the same model for going, doing large-scale combat operations that we had in, in the Soviet times. We have, you know, the field army and the theater army. And the Russians... Mm -hmm. You know, when they went this massive downsizing, they decided that you know, the system that they had in Soviet times is not going to work for this, this new threat. So they need to have a way of, of uh, you know, they have small, far, small, uh, far smaller military. They need to come up with a new way of, uh, of you know, c providing advocate command and control with these new threats mm -hmm. and downsizing so they don't have as many of these uh, you know, staff officer positions and general officer positions. And this is kind of the way that the Russians have, have chosen to do that. They're trying to go to this system where they have these joint, or these, uh, joint strategic commands and these army groups as kind of their, their primary levels of, uh, of, uh, of action. So if you, if you look at the very bottom level, at the tactical level, it's the battalion or the battalion tactical group. The combined arms level, it's the brigade or the uh, regiment division. And then at this joint structure, it's the uh, the army group or the, com or the um, uh, military, the Joint Strategic Command. Wes? And looking at a lot of the training, what you see is a lot of training in what they call the maneuver defense, which is not our mobile defense. And unfortunately, a lot of Russian gets translated into mobile defense, but it's, uh, it's maneuver defense. Uh, mobile defense means you keep the bulk of your forces back. You, uh, you intend to lose ground and then you're gonna retake it. Uh, maneuver defense means you may not be back there, but what you're going to do is you are going to attrit the attacking force uh, constantly on the way back. And so the artillery plays a large role in maneuver defense. And this should be no surprise because uh, Russia and the Soviet army have always been artillery armies and they have a lot of tanks. But uh, artillery enables maneuver, and artillery can be used in a variety of ways. Artillery is a maneuver force, and you can take ground with artillery. Mm -hmm. These are not Western concepts, but uh, this, is, this is how they look at warfare. And if you look at the brigade structure, uh, a Motorized uh, Rifle Brigade has three uh, motorized rifle battalions, a tank battalion, four artillery battalions, two howitzer, one MLRS, and uh, one anti-tank, a uh, engineer battalion, support battalion, signal battalion, what am I forgetting? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, uh, and Radio Electronic, uh, Electronic Warfare Company. Company at brigade level. So it is a very competent standalone force when it has to be. And it's, uh, 
Oh, there you go. Yeah, sorry. My, hey, <laughs> I should have yeah. brought that up. So I thought, making I, you roll I, through the whole list there. But. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I thought it was having a flashback. <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, it's a smaller brigade than we have, it's, but it's fairly lethal. And it's got everything you need. And so, uh, and it's a lot easier to move. Do we have anything stirring to end it with? Hmm. We'll leave it to Mike for the stirring bit. Okay, Mike. All right. I, I think it's a wonderful presentation, Jean. Thank you. Um, it, uh, and the turnout's been fantastic for a Friday morning. I'm, I'm, Quite impressed. I, I'd like to, if I can, maybe frame this a bit from my perspective, style it somewhat, and, and take us to a place where we can all have a great collective conversation, good Q&A. So first, for me, on the history of how the Russian military got to where it is today from, from the Soviet military they inherited, I think in the Russian armed forces, most people when right in the military thought they make sure to cite the key main strategies from Tukhachevsky to ASVEC and all that. You can't get on without it. But to me, this is really ultimately the consistency I see in Russian military reform and the reform to the Russian military reform under Shoiku Gerasimov. The consistency is really the intellectual product of the Agarkov period of 1977 to 1984. And these are really Marshall Agarkov's intellectual children that finally come back home in many respects to build the military and transform the Soviet armed forces in a way that he sought to do but was unable to do for different reasons. He had too much opposition. The Soviet Union was economically dying. At the peak of its technological might when it collapsed, he sought to transform the Soviet military into a military that could answer what they saw as the fundamental challenges of the character of war and of the U.S. character of war, where things were heading in 1980s and 1990s. Both the technologies, the capabilities that were deployed, and the operational concepts and how they had evolved. And, and to me, you know, Agarkov back then really sought to address the problems he identified with Soviet Union having fallen well far behind in communications, advanced weapons, ISR to actually use them, battle space management targeting, especially automated command and control. Many of the weapons capabilities we see deployed today through the Russian military are really concepts that date back to that time period of mid to late 1980s who have finally been realized and deployed across the Russian armed forces. They envisioned a balanced force that consisted of what is the idea behind this big force structure? A general purpose force for war fighting, local, regional, large scale wars, right? A force that is able to affect what Rogakov dreamed of, which was a non nuclear strategic deterrent, that is, can play in the game of long range conventional precision strike and can engage the United States or NATO in the European theater. A capable force of non-strategic nuclear weapons that have shifted into the escalation management role and perhaps less war fighting at tactical level. A force that feels high readiness combat groupings of mixed forces able to conduct either offensive or defensive operations along their assigned strategic direction. The map that we see with the military districts and the army groupings show us three main strategic directions, right? The southwest, the west, and the north in the European theater and military of operations as these forces are arrayed. Um, he envisioned the strategic importance of air defense and the integration of the air force and the air defense forces, which we finally saw realized in recent years with the development of the airspace forces that combine air defense, missile defense, and the air force. Why? Because in the 1980s, the Soviet general staff understood the United States where war was really shifting towards an initial and rather effective airspace blitzkrieg attack. That airspace power was proving increasingly decisive in the initial period of conflict they would need to find a way to defend against it, to develop an effective strategic operation for air defense and their own offensive strategic air operation as well. And of course, the institution of high-end command uh, staff exercises to work out questions of operational art strategy and refine all these command relationships and echelons. If you follow the Russian armed forces, you know that they change echelon and command relationships kind of all the time, and they change force structure all the time as they play with it and play with it some more and reorg and reorg and reorg. Such is the nature of things. And today, you even see them kind of going to the next level from these strategic command staff exercises, where one military district and their joint strategic command takes in a whole bunch of units from other district and commands in order to field them in a strategic direction to getting to a place where officers from one combined arms army, let's say, can take in divisions, brigade, and units from a different combined arms army and actually fuel them in an exercise in order to make it more and more interchangeable. Why? 
So it has a lot to do also with the Russian vision of what is the current character of war. And that is the belief that ultimately a conflict with NATO is going to be a large-scale war that goes from Norway to Turkey. It is a war in entire European theater and military operations. There is, in my view, no this Russian sense that there's going to be some small fight in the Baltics over a small piece of terrain where they deploy and then they defend and then it's going to be a matter of how other you know, US forces get in there. No, it is a preparation for large-scale conflict, why we call it large-scale combat operations. And when they look at the nature of large-scale operations, they believe that there are two decisive periods of war. The threatened period of war, who shapes the environment, who deploys in the, during the crisis to the run-up to the conflict. And the initial period of war, and in their view, the initial period of war will be a matter of weeks. The large-scale operations, given the current character of war, will not last a long time. One side will be proven wrong, the other side will be proven right, right. Or what most likely will happen, as it tends to happen in war, both sides will be proven wrong, and the side that adapts and reacts best to their assumptions having been proven wrong is the most flexible, is the one that will ultimately prevail. However, they don't expect the conflict to be sustained for a long period of time, and that has a lot to do with their view about the character of war. That does go back to original thinking and strategy. War is not a contest of material and manpower attrition. It is about who can perform best at the operational level to effectively destroy the other side's ability to sustain combat operations. And their view is that in a war, which at the end of we know is a contest of wills, there are two systems. There's the military system, and the military system's ability to fight and sustain the fight. It's not about tanks killing tanks or planes killing planes, although we understand that's necessary. It is about how do you destroy the other side's system's ability to sustain the fight in the theater. And there's a political system, and the political system has resolve. And it's a question of how do you inflict the right amount of tailored or prescribed damage to shape the political system's resolve such that they will not want to continue the fight or that they will want to pause the fight and negotiate about the fight, depending on the stakes at hand. But you get the gist. Next, and I'll conclude with these two points. There's often a conflation, I think, of Russian force planning and structure for different levels of war. Why I'm excited that we're very focused on large-scale combat operations today because Russians see there's you now there's crisis conflict, there's local conflict, local war, which is to them what Georgia and Ukraine is. There's regional war and there's large scale war, okay? And so there's often been this perception that this force structure might somehow generate, as, as Chuck and Lester rightly put, battalion tactical groups for a particular fight. No, that's how the Russians think they will handle a conflict with Georgia or another local conflict because this force has good readiness and he can force generate battalion tactical groups and it can manage a small military without a problem on short notice, be pretty mobile. But for an actual conflict with a country like China or with the United States, this force thinks about large-scale combat operations. The hub of that is the Combined Arms Army, which is the operational level command that then has lots of things attached to it, but that army basically leads the fight and is intellectually the, really the center of, of, of war fighting at the operational level. And that's why divisions came back. Brigades are too small, too light. They won't last long in the fight. Brigades have really shifted to be the operational reserve. That is, if the division breaks through, the brigade can follow to help exploit. And if the division fails in defense, the brigade can move in to close the gap where enemy forces have broken through. But the brigade is not going to last long. Certainly not against necessarily a US uh, armored brigade combat team. Um, and last but not least, I'd make this one point that there is now that they've built out this force and they've exercised it. And it's certainly not the largest force that Russia's ever fielded. It's actually probably one of the smallest. If you look at the overall ground force combined with the, um, the airborne troops, it's maybe about 350 plus thousand strong. It's not that large as the ground force component. But now that they've built it out, it's probably about the highest readiness it's ever been at. It's certainly probably much higher readiness than the Soviet Union was ever in the 1980s. Now, they're increasingly looking to balance the readiness of the force, the mobility they have, with the actual size, which is the, the density and mass they can bring to the battlefield. And that's a conversation about what percentage of the force should be mobilized. That is, what percentage readiness do they really need in staffing in these divisions versus in a threatened period of war, if they expect a crisis leading up to a fight with the United States or NATO for 30 days or plus, how much manpower can they bring in to fill these units? At what level do they need to be staffed? Right? And, and sort of balance out because I think increasingly their view is that they need a larger force. 
but you don't want to pay for a larger force on active duty. So part of the force will have to be mobilized to some extent, right? That is, you know, they'll be, they'll, they're now, now reducing probably the degree of readiness while building out the overall size of the force. And that gets into a conversation which we can have about the, the reserve system and the two different models and ideas, essentially the two different reserve systems build out. Okay, on that, I won't talk too much. I don't forget how long I've been talking. Let's, let's turn it over to, uh, to Jeff and, and he can head us off to Q&A. Okay, thanks. Um, we covered a lot of ground, so to speak, I guess. Um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience now. I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask, so I'm going to abuse the moderator's privilege to do that. Um, then we'll open it up. Um, wait to be called on if you want to ask a question. There'll be microphones coming around. Um, when you get the microphone, uh, please identify yourself. Please be brief and please ask a question uh, rather than make a statement. Um, okay, so let me start with a couple of questions I had. Um, one, can we go back to the map that showed the disposition of the different army groups and, and corps? Yeah. Oh, I turned it off. Oh. Well. What? What'd you do? Okay, anyway. When you attack sergeant. Yeah, it's okay. The basic question I had was, you showed where the different force structures were distributed around the country, and they were concentrated along the western frontier and along um, the southeast, or near the borders with China. What's the relative weight of those different um, groups? Uh, what percentage of men and materiel is in each of those fronts, and how capable uh, is the Russian military of moving those assets back and forth depending on where a, a crisis may emerge. And then the second question I had, which is kind of related, is you talked about the Russian forces inside Russia. Um, what role do uh, Russian troops who are based outside the country uh, in places like Tajikistan or uh, Crimea or Armenia, uh, what role do they play in the overall um, operational planning and what's their relationship to uh, the military forces that are concentrated inside the country. Yeah, well, percentage-wise, I don't have the exact one. You've got to remember we're open source, so. <laughs> but uh, if, if you uh, remember the map, the forces are concentrated on the western direction to the south. We're very concerned about the Baltic Republics, but there's really not anything of significance except an airborne uh, division between them and St. Petersburg. And if there's any place that the Svetchen Doctrine is not going to work, it's the 100 kilometers between uh, uh, Estonia and, and St. Pete. So I would say that uh, primarily uh, the forces are, are facing Ukraine and they're facing the south. Um, forces outside and what they can do, well, uh, Syria has been proving uh, a good testing ground for materials and all. It has, uh, it has strained their logistics system. They are not an expeditionary force. The history of Russia is not a history of uh, expeditions. They, they fight with their back to Mother Russia or in Mother Russia, uh, with a few minor exceptions. And they have basically uh, beat up their amphibious uh, capability, uh, trying to keep the, the Syrian operation going but they've been trying all, all sorts of new systems and, uh, and new uh, uh, technology there, and doing some rather spectacular things like long-range missile strikes, et cetera, um, and, and playing a political role. The um, So what about Armenia? Well. That's, has a, that has a dual role. It, it's, it sends a message, but it's also, uh, it's also um, tucked right into the Caucasus, and uh, that's an area that you need to keep 
uh, some reaction uh, next to. Uh, what was the other? I mean, it, that was basically a what role do the Russian forces that are distributed in mostly the former Soviet countries play in sort of overall strategic thinking? Yeah, I mean, generally the stuff out in the Far East is a little bit lower level of readiness. You know, if, if there's something happens with China, I don't know if, if a conventional force is going to stop. You know, the Chinese military is so huge that probably be some other way other than a conventional way they would stop it. But in terms of the logistics, how they support, um, big difference between the, the Russian uh, armed forces and the U.S. one is, is uh, the importance of pipe and rail. So a, a lot of the strategic reserve assets for the, for the Russian military is kept out in the, uh, uh, in the central military district in the second army around Ekaterinburg, you know, like the 90th tank division. So if, if, uh, you know, if they need to fight, they can get that division. You know, it can get, pretty much get anywhere in the country because all that rail hub is out there. And then once they get it out there, um, you know, they have a rail infrastructure where they can supply it, and they have a, a, a pipe infrastructure where they can, where can bring that fuel to them, as opposed to the you know, U.S. military, which does a lot of stuff by trucks. These guys are primarily, you know, it's a, it's a rail-based military, very much so. Okay, yeah. Jeff Fox, um, Add to colleagues already great points. Yeah, Central Military District's a swing district to support East and, and, and West, depending on where the fight is. East really represents an independent combat grouping of forces because of how strained the infrastructure is, lines of communication to them, and is meant to be able to hold a fight by itself. And it's arranged differently if you look at the forces there. It has much larger sort of filled out ground force structure, but also has way more missile units than typical other military districts have assigned to them for a particular reason. Uh, Eastern Military District is, is both disadvantaged and heavily advantaged by distance, right? Is whenever we talk about Chinese military, you say, well, if you attack the Eastern Military District, the good news is, sure, you can have a large force, but then you've actually won terrain in the Eastern Military District and have fun with that. Um, as far as readiness, I think probably Southern Military District is by, by far the, the highest, followed by Western MD. Uh, Joint Arctic District is transitioning to become a real full-fledged military district. There's, there's a discussion on that to flesh it out some more. Um, on Jeff's points regarding external bases and the foreign base and all that, well, these are really like key four posts and they can serve as really good hubs for Russian other, other Russian forces to arrive, right? So we see where they are from uh, Transnistria down to Armenia, down to Tajikistan. Um, they've, they've, they've gone through some force transitions in size, uh, basically being downgraded in, in some respects, but have a better standing force that's there. And as always, um, I agree, I absolutely agree with Russian military is fundamentally not an expeditionary force, but it is a country that's capable of expeditionary operations. They're just not scalable, but they can intervene fairly effectively with a small force and prove decisive in the conflict. Syria has shown that. One thing that I suggest those of you who follow this topic really should follow the changes in structural reforms that are happening, taking place to the Russian airborne, which are long overdue. And they've been in progress for some time, where the Russian airborne is probably one. It's filling out as a bigger force. It's finally getting back to three regiment uh, divisions out of two regiments. And it's building itself out as a force with two missions. It still has the strategic airborne uh, parachute assault mission. And Russian like long range uh, transportation park, VTA, is not great. But it's probably capable of delivering like two BTGs or a regiment almost anywhere within Europe. And if you kind of, if you're not following that, you really should reflect 20 years ago on June 12th, the, the Russian movement to Pristina. And uh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's reflect on our history. So it's important not to get surprised and not to tell ourselves a story that, uh, well, Russian airborne is not capable of like an expeditionary throw some thousand kilometers from their borders because it actually very is capable of doing that and of seizing an airfield and then of several air assault regiments then arriving on that airfield. And one reason why you want to have bases outside is any place where you can have an air base, Russian airborne can arrive within 24, 48 hours. And if they can land on that air base, then they can unload. And they can probably unload at their current state of readiness at least several regiments. All right? And that's kind of like the beginning of an intervention. So yes, it's not that expeditionary. But given they are like 1 8 thirds land mass, and they have decent reach from that 1 8th. OK, great. Uh, let's go to questions. Uh, start over here. Thank you very much.
smaller forces. Yeah, I'll field the one on the private military companies. Um, I mean, you talk about large scale combat operations. I mean, private military companies are great for, you know, this kind of low level insurgency stuff that goes on and, and, you know, maybe in Syria or these different places. But, you know, we talk about this large scale fight. I mean, these private military companies are just get a sideshow. I mean, it's, it's such a small element that, I mean, it, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people fighting with large scale combat operations. Private military companies, you know, Maybe a couple hundred guys. So, in terms of in terms of, of a large scale combat operations, private, private military company is not really important. But obviously, I, I do think it's important. But for this, these other smaller conflicts that are going on. And as for the other thing, less I'll kind of. Well, we don't I was, was going to also anymore. add gas problem. Yeah, you know, like securing some of the the facilities, but uh, but not for fighting large scale combat operations. Mm -hmm. The Russian Navy is still capable, of course, of operating in the Persian Gulf. What I was talking about is primarily their amphibious landing ships, they, uh, primarily the Rapuchka class, which uh, a great deal of them were built in the 60s in Poland. They are all in desperate need of uh, uh, overhaul. They've been borrowing them from the various fleets, uh, basically doing the, uh, doing the run uh, for Syria. And uh, they've been using them as logistics uh, ships because of their their roll-on, uh, uh, roll-off roll capability. But that that part of the Navy really needs some work. The other, the rest of the Navy is pretty much the same. The money has been going primarily to uh, the ground forces and uh, maintaining the air forces. The Navy is not happy with that situation, and uh, they're looking for more. They are bringing new ships online and all, but uh, not, not to the degree that the Navy likes. Thank you. Okay, uh, in the back. <laughs> Jeff. Uh, no, Dr. Oh, Elaine Sarai. Uh, hang on just a second. We had a, Mike had a, a Yeah, I shut up. Sorry. That's okay. Go Don't for break. it. With Colin Navy. Uh, Daniel, to your question. The Navy had been effectively transitioning to a very capable green water force with ships that have much lower endurance but have all the capability of a Soviet class destroyer of heavy anti submarine warfare ship in reality. And so today there is a fact, the fact of a permanent standing squadron, a much smaller squadron in the Eastern Mediterranean, right, of some ships and two submarines that are permanently seemingly based out of Tartus. That said, it, it, it's the presence is there. What the ships can do themselves on the size and the size of platform, the capability they can deliver, has transitioned quite a bit, right? Um, on, on Luster's point regarding LSTs, they've not seriously invested in native, like organic naval support for expeditionary operations. They're only now laying down L, a couple LPDs. Um, most of Syria cargo support for that mission was done through four cargo ships bought from Turkey. So here are the two truths. Yes, they've not invested in that. They are not a military with massive global uh, sea lift architecture and infrastructure like we do with bases and all these other things the United States does. Actually, nobody is, right? That being said, they do demonstrate that actually you can effectively supply an expeditionary operation with just a handful of cargo ships, and you can do that pretty well. It's not roll on, roll off, but they also harden decks on cargo ships as well, so they can transport a lot of gear on top of them. And as always, we should like 
be very, as I say, be careful not to think like us, that we didn't buy a massive platform for a particular mission, and so if the other person didn't buy a massive platform for a particular mission, that they can't affect that mission when the time comes. <coughs> okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Elaine Sereo, Associate Rector of UACU in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, could you address how this reorganization will be perceived by the border nations uh, will it affect how they see their relationships going forward with the U.S. in light of the in light of the reorganization uh, along the Russian border? And if so, how so? Thank you. Um, you know, we we spend our full time reading Russian publications, and so I. I Certainly not qualified to answer on that. And this, this, they didn't really reorganize. There's no, you know, this isn't a special reorganization that's happened in the last couple of years. This is the, I believe, the way that it's always been kind of intended for this, this large scale fight. You know, this is for the survival of the state. This is not something that's been done in the, in the last couple of years. Now they're, they're tweaking individual places to it and they're, they're changing certain things, they're improving things, but this is not a, a, a new. You know, a totally new development. This is just part of the. You know, I imagine most nations have a, you know, have a plan to de defend themselves militarily, and this is just part of that, part of that plan and tweaking that plan. Mm -hmm. Can I just briefly comment? Yeah. So, I thought really, you know, under the initial period of tumultuous reforms to the to the new look army under Makarov Serdikov, their plans were a little bit crazy because they really were not building out a military necessarily designed for a large-scale ground fight with NATO. And they essentially had left the airborne as the rapid response force. They were investing a lot in a strategic role of air defense and airspace, right? But they, they were actually not well set up um, in terms of brigade structure they were building and the for, for a large-scale combat operation in Europe. Nor did any of the command relationships make any sense, and they quickly figured it out when they started doing strategic exercises with the new look force, because Makarov and Sirtikov wanted to eliminate the combined arms army echelon entirely, and somehow OSK was going to command brigades and divisions, and, and then get rid of divisions themselves. It just didn't make a lot of sense. So when under Gerasimov and Shoigu, I feel they went to in, in a much more sensible and balanced direction. And this is now a force that is able to handle the full range of contingencies of you know, local conflict crisis, whatever it is the local war is on Russia's borders, to high-end fight with NATO in the full theater and military operations to affect theater and nuclear escalation war fighting missions too. And it's got that, that full scope. Um, I have no idea how the, the smaller nations look at it. I, that, 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 part, that part is difficult to comment on. I would only say that Probably think Chuck Lester, you'd agree that a, a percentage of the force in recent years, force structure that's been created on Ukraine's borders after 2014 is very, clear, very clearly meant with Ukraine in mind in the event of a contingency, in the event that they need to intervene, that they have established a number of divisions of brigades, a new combined arms army, and they have filled them out, not all of them, but parts of them they filled out already almost completely, and as a very, very large conventional ground force in the event that they do require uh, to intervene in Ukraine again. Okay. Um, over there on the side. Yes, uh, Frank Fletcher with Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Um, in the Soviet system, traditionally, counterintelligence was only entrusted to the KGB. What is the state today of counterintelligence authority? Is it only the FSB penetrating all the other services, including the new National Guard? We do tanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I also do tanks, planes, and ships. But um, uh, on intelligence, this, this, this is a great question. There is no the sort of unified KGB hub, because remember, in those days, there were KGB units. There was KGB uh, internal intelligence. A lot of units had KGB tag next to them. I think that's very much a shared mission between FSB and GRU, right? Depending, depending on what you are doing in counterintelligence sent. But in Russia, it's a perpetual fight between intelligence services as to who has the mission and what type of counterintelligence you're doing, right? 
like cybersecurity is always going to be a consistent fight between different intelligence services to who really has the lead and has the assets on that. And that's one of the most important forms of counterintelligence today that we didn't have in the 1970s. So I hope, I hope this part of it makes sense. But this is that question. We're just probably not the best, uh, I think, expert-wise equipped crowd to, to, to answer on who does CI. OK. Um, let's go over here. Uh, Stanley Kober. I'm trying to figure out what the point is. If your economic model of an empire, which is of imperial expansion, is the Middle Kingdom gets to um, exploit the tributary states, then it makes sense. But what we have seen over the last century, in particular, is that the financial flows go in the opposite direction. The money flows from the center to the periphery. That is why the Soviet empire collapsed. That is why the other empires collapsed. What is the point? Let us say Russia is successful. What in the world could it do now that it has to rule millions and millions of people who will hate its guts? Yeah, I, I don't think we're, we don't, we're not proposing the Russians are setting up this force structure to go out and invade other countries. I mean, we're talking about, you know, if it does get into military conflict, what, you know, what is it going to do? I don't, I mean, I think I don't usually speak for Les, but I think me and Les are generally of the opinion that uh, if Russians are going to be involved in, in military activities, they probably aren't going to go much outside of the, the former Soviet Union. You know, I, you know, I'm not worried about the, the Russians going into France. You know, it's not, it's not feasible. What's that? Even in the former Soviet Union. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, yeah, I, I think not necessarily like taking territory. You know, they could do some military uh, operation to achieve some objective, and uh, you know, it's not necessarily about just taking territory or, or occupying more territory. It's uh, it, you know, there's other reasons for fighting than just taking territory. So, okay. I mean, I think this does offer us an opportunity to tee off sort of the, the Russian thinking in the initial period of war of what this force is meant to do, what its posture really is. And I think the best way to describe that is probably counter surprise because intellectually, the general staff had always believed after uh, June 1941 that the one thing that the Russian military must never permit again to happen is a large scale initial surprise attack that successfully destroys a substantial percentage of forward based forces and then it inflicts a huge amount of pain, de facto finding an industrial scale war based on attrition on the Russian territory itself. And so this force, and that's one of the challenges with it, is that in order to be effectively positioned for counter surprise, you have to have a pretty high degree of readiness, you have a pretty high degree of mobility, and as a force, you have to consistently exercise your ability to first absorb an attack and then to effectively counterattack. And that is what Russian forces consistently do in their strategic exercises. Most of them begin with an initial attack that they are deflecting and reacting to, and then a substantial counterattack that they are engaged in. I mean, to me, this is kind of for large scale operations, at least what the force structure concept is. And then beyond, of course, understanding that in modern day conflict, the geographical space doesn't matter, right? United States, NATO, between all our long-range standoff conventional arsenal, airspace attack, there's no real depth. You can go counter value right at the beginning. You can take out ground lines of communications. You can hit critical objects. So the sort of like, there's sort of an imaginary 100 kilometer distance separating ground forces, but in reality, when it comes to the nature of modern warfare, it doesn't separate anyone at all. And the understanding that the, given the, the pace of modern, of modern warfare, that that force needs to be positioned to both absorb an airspace attack and to be able to conduct some effective strikes of its own. Okay. Um, here. You touched on this very briefly, but I just wonder if you could give a little more detail about your thoughts on as Russia uh, increases its emphasis on the Arctic, how might that affect the force structure, not just in the Northwest, but across the entirety of the Arctic coast? Well, they have been doing quite a bit in the Arctic with the Northern Sea Route. Uh, economically, the Arctic is, has been and is a major factor in their economy. The Norilsk uh, produces a great deal of uh, 
all sorts of metals that uh, can only come out through the Arctic and then over to Murmansk and onto the railroad, rail lines, etc. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, natural resources are up there. The Yamal Peninsula, they have three major uh, liquid natural gas projects going on right now, which are uh, major investments for them, but they're also uh, bringing in a lot of foreign partners on that. They are opening uh, uh, liquid natural gas facilities off Kamchatka and drawing off of this. They're uh, basically uh, the Arctic is one of the things that uh, is, is, a, is a major economic factor, and they're continuing to develop it and put money in it. And they have built up the, uh, the, the ground and naval forces in that area to, uh, to protect it. And they have brought their air defense forces back into the region, as well as air forces, not and to the same degree as before. But they are quite concerned about the security of the Northern Sea Route. And I'm one of my, well, basically, they're doing a lot of rail uh, to support this. It's not just military. It's, it's about the economy. It's about uh, the areas they can get into now with the uh, receding cap up there. Uh, they're building all sorts of icebreakers. They've got uh, 42 uh, working the area, and they have uh, six uh, on, on order right now uh, that are nuclear powered. Uh, and they're very serious about the Arctic. Hmm. So, yeah, the Arctic. Uh, this is your your fifth military district and operational strategic command and the only one headed by the Navy and maybe a model for if they create further military districts from what they have uh, uh, may prove the model as, as we look at it uh, the ground forces is only three brigades but uh, I, I for an Arctic force, that's pretty big. Can I, sorry, if I can just briefly chime on this. So, uh, lots of great comments. I, I think it's principally driven by in one economic project and two military projects. And a lot of it is also is particularly driven by the military. The economic project is Novatech and LNG shipping, which to them is really an interesting commercial development project with viability, unlike Gazprom. And the Arctic is one of the main things that the political system is interested in. It's a bit of a really great fantasy frontier, and they spend a lot of money into it. In it, and even if it doesn't seem like it has economic rationale, it has a lot of economic rationale because you can spend lots of money out of state budget and just give it to a bunch of people to build things there. And and let's put it this way, it 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 makes sense given the way given the way the Russian political system and the economy is set up. That is, it's very profitable for the people engaged in it, even if you don't think that the projects themselves have an economic rationale. On the military side, two brief comments. One, first, the airspace domain. You know, as part of modernization, they rebuilt the early warning radar network, and then they started setting up picket radars there with short-range air defense around those picket radars. Why? Because a huge piece of terrain that's a massive access point to Russia over the top over which you have, they didn't have visibility. So first of all, they wanted to gain visibility on it. Then they wanted to set up some picket radars there. Why? Because it's very obvious that from their perspective, U.S. could come easily over the top and can got, conduct a large cruise missile attack with air forces. Of course, we would never do that. We are very nice, peace-loving people, and we have never thought of that. Uh, that said, that was issue one. Issue two is maritime domain, their view being, of course, that United States and other services obviously can operate missiles up there. I'm um, sorry, not missile submarines with cruise, with cruise missiles on them. Those submarines can also launch cruise missiles from that, from that uh, area. And they can hit into Russia. Again, you want to see incoming cruise missile strikes. You might say that's no big deal, but remember, it wasn't that long ago 
um, during the late period of the Cold War and after the Cold War II, that those cruise missiles were TLMNs, and there's absolutely nothing to say that there won't be some next generation of something that looks like TLMN, but is much worse, that won't come down the line, and Russians, of course, are thinking 20 to 30 years out, because in the Arctic, if you want to be in a particular place with infrastructure, you want to be thinking 20 years ahead and building stuff now. It's very hard to work and operate under, right? So there's always a not slouching, and they're trying to picture what the, what the operating environment will be 20 years from now, and what are the various things that the United States or other people might do? Okay. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, my understanding from your presentation is that uh, while this is a Russian uh, force that's uh, smaller, um, in the aggregate it has become more lethal and more agile, and that in part that's due uh, to its ability to operate jointly, uh, to bring together joint effects. Um, so my question to you is, if I was a military planner um, in a large-scale conflict uh, with the Russian military, um, at what echelon of command should I target my effects to kind of disaggregate uh, that force to make it less lethal, less agile, less mobile? And uh, what, if those, what would those type of effects be? What would be the best type of effects uh, to do that? Operational. I'll, I'll be coming Go for over to Kyle. So um, that's great. I'm glad that you framed it in terms of large scale operations in support of some weird, contrived, small fight or a very small piece of terrain in the Baltics that war gamers like to have, but nobody in Russia in reality is planning to have. It's like, let's have two of the world's leading nuclear powers have a very, very tiny fight in a closet in this remote piece of terrain, and that's going to be really the battle, and that's how it's going to open up. Um, so first and foremost, the level you want to be dealing with the Russian military is always the operational level. And I'm going to make a point that I hope colleagues will agree with. Um, but sort of my experience in the whole US military and, and sort of strategic culture really does excel at the tactical level. But we sometimes have that tactical level of excellence disease where we get chauvinistic towards militaries that aren't good as a tactical level. And the Russian military has never been as good at the tactical level. But it's fairly consistently beaten militaries that were better than them at the tactical level because they were not so good at the operational level and in terms of operational art. And their strategic thinking was not that great because they were technology fetishists. And they thought, hey, the problem, you can procure your way out of it. We just buy lots of stuff. And we're good at the tactical level, and lots of good stuff plus ex excellence at tactical level equals win. All right? And it does not. Consistently does not against the Russian forces. It can at times. Well, one's a good example. But more often than not, it just doesn't. Right? So for me, you really want to be focused on the level of the combined arms army. Right? And, and maybe Chuck and Lester might have a, a different view here. But that's where you want to target your, your effects. That's where the leadership will be that will organize the, the fight in that particular front. And the higher echelon is obviously the Joint Strategic Command, but I don't know if you're going to be the commander that's going to have the capabilities to shape that sort of thing. Now we're John. I mean, you see that the general staff people will be at three different echelons. They'll be in that Combined Arms Army, the uh, Joint Strategic Command, and then the General Staff Headquarters. That's where that operational level planner sits. It's kind of a kind of a cast of, of people. It's not like the U.S. where we rotate people through assignments. They leave these guys in these assignments for a very long time. You know, once they get into this general staff system, they're going to rotate between those three assignments. So these operational level planners are in those three different commands. So those would be the three different levels you'd have to target if you wanted to target the, uh, you know, like the joint or the, those, those kind of capabilities. Or and okay. having, the, having the general staff, of course, has its advantages, whether it, it, not, not subject to what they call the trade union mentality, but it's, it's, it's looking at the total package. OK, uh, further questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, John Chicky, Department of Defense. Uh, first, thanks for the, um, the conversation today. It's very interesting, and, if, and I'm glad you guys put it together. Two questions. The first thing, I didn't see on your chart anything about Special Operations Command, so if you can talk a little bit, the Special Operations play in large-scale uh, combat operations. Uh, and the second question, uh, given the description that the panel has on how the Russians think about warfare and how the opening stages of a conflict will be, they will be highly lethal probably. That means the intensity will be very high. 
the rate of ammunition use will be extremely high. So where is the logistics capability to sustain that fight in, 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 you know, in the initial days? Thanks. Yeah, I, I just talk about the special operations. You know, they don't have a SOCOM or whatever like, like we do. And, you know, the special operations forces are a lot smaller. There are big differences. You know, we think of elite in the U.S. system. We think of special operations. The Russians don't make that. You know, there's not a, there's not a equal sign between the word elite and special operations. They have elite units in the Russian military that are not special operations units. Some of their special operations units are not that elite. Yeah. So it's, it's the, you know, the, the biggest chunk of the special operations guys, we call special operations guys, are in these GRU Spetsnaz brigades. There's probably 10 of them, maybe 1,500 guys per brigade. And uh, you know, it looks kind of like a motorized rifle battalion. I mean, they're on BTR, they're on uh, armored personnel carriers. You know, they're, they're, their job's pretty much reconnaissance. They do you know, the reconnaissance for that army group, you know, finding those targets, destroying key targets. But uh, I mean, in, in terms of the, the fight, I mean, it's much, much less, these special operations forces are much less important for the Russians than they are for us. I mean, they do have an important role, granted, definitely, but you know, it's kind of like private military companies. You know, the, you know, it's definitely less important than these con massive conventional units that they have. You know, they have a, they have a supporting role. Yes. I, and to follow up on that, if you're looking for the elite force, it's the airborne. They're the strategic reserve, and um, they are now getting tanks. Okay. So they're, they're getting heavier. And, uh, but, but these, if, you, if you're looking for where is the elite, uh, it's, it's the airborne. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that, as always, naval infantry. Yeah, airborne's getting restructured again. It's getting tanks again. It had tanks before. It lost tanks. It's getting tanks. It's losing tanks. This is always the state of Russia and the airborne, but it's like building out to, to both maintain the strategic air assault mission, the standard air assault divisions, and brigades is getting a lot more mobility. Where are you going to get? Where are you going to get with them? Because they bought a metric ton of helicopters during, during the first state armament program, a lot. And so the Russian military has really regained air mobility and is increasingly looking to see what they can do with it and starting to do force restructuring at that sort of short tactical operational level to the extent these units can basically airlift, take strategic terrain right behind enemy lines and, and, and do things like that. I, I agree with what Chuck said. I mean, Spetsnaz GRU is really uh, sort of base recon elite infantry in support of conventional ground force formations for large scale combat operations. They wanted to do what kind of a bit more what USOF does, but they just didn't get that mission. If anyone has that, that's KSO, Special Operations Command. The one neat thing about it, that the only thing I would add to this is that as Russian military is genuinely implementing recon strike, recon fire loops, right, and is increasingly able to see the battlefield at tactical operational depths, all right, to engage targets in real time, to do real time battle damage assessment re-engagement, right, and to add precision to their traditional advantages of density and mass of fires and firepower, right? These units also have an important role because they add redundancy to the ISR platforms that the military is able to field. A person with, you know, a stray lefts or other type system forward can mark immediately for artillery targets and at that tactical range can have them engage these targets, which is something that, you know, probably Spetsnaz from the 80s could only have dreamed of. So it's becoming relevant in terms of the big changes in command and control that have taken place in the Russian military. And this to me is always, I say, this was Ogarkov's fantasy, this dream of a military able to engage in non-contact warfare and to add precision and smart weapons to its traditional advantages and firepower that it already had on the battlefield. Did anyone want to take the logistics question? Oh, question? Yeah, I can do it real quick. Uh, so, like I said earlier, it's pipe and rail. I mean, if, if the rear logistics support areas for these combined arms armies and probably even the brigades are going to be congruent with these rail lines. And they may, you know, if it's a large scale combat operation, they may have to follow that rail line because uh, just the way they do logistics support. You know, if you look at the, the number of trucks in the Russian army, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a lot of trucks. And uh, so they, they, that's kind of the way they envision it. And when they do, the, if they do do a massive, uh, recall of reservists, a lot of these guys will be truck drivers and we have to pull some of these trucks out of the, out of the civilian economy. But uh, and the road network's not that good either. Yeah, but g generally it's, it's this rail, rail and pipe system and that's how, they're, that's how they envision uh, logistically supporting these. And the, the, rail, uh, the railroad troops are a major mm -hmm. chunk of the Russian forces. So, and how hard is it to take out a rail? Well, not that tough. How long is it to take it out for any period of time? 
That's the that's the the question. And just put like the railroad troops, they aren't actually going out and driving the trains necessarily. The railroad troops are just there to defend the rail lines and rebuild them if necessary. You know, they're relying on their civilian, uh, you know, the kind of the quasi-state government uh, rail line, inf you know, rail line infrastructure and railroads and trains and all that stuff to to bring up the supplies at the front. They're not relying on these railroad troops. The railroad troops are just maintaining the lines mm -hmm. in, co in combat areas. So and they can I mean, build new lines. Yeah, so I mean, they can, they can build new lines and build a few, you know, in Ukraine, they've had a couple of areas where they had to close yep. off and they built, you know, these railroad troops went out there and built lines around the, uh, the partitioned off areas. So it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a pretty pretty important mission. They have a lot of capability there just pulling out of that civilian economy. That was just add, and bridge troops, because you've seen a lot of Russian exercise where they practice more often than not, is of course bridging and the ability to get forces across rivers, assuming the bridges have been taken out. I think there's a and pontoon this, this, brigade yep. in the, uh, if I can get back down. A there's, lot. There's a pontoon brigade, I think, in the, uh, in the, uh, I mean, part of the reorg was to fix the problem with combat service support, MTO, because the new look reforms initially, the way Sierra Dikov and Makar put it, made absolutely no sense. There was no combat service support for these brigades that they built. It was like, okay, the brigade goes, and who's going to provide the combat service support for it once it meets actual combat? And how's the logistics going to be organized? And they said, this doesn't work. You have to go back to the divisional structure. The division has enough of that kit in it. And then the combined arms army itself, as the operational level command, will have the logistics unit given to it by the OSK, and they will support the divisions. Um, but yeah, this is, so, I mean, this might be, the, that's probably, it's certainly not the most exciting and uh, room riveting topic of railway troops and combat service support and logistics, but it's one of the bigger, one of the bigger important changes that have taken place in Russian armed forces over the last couple of years. Okay, we've got time for one or two more questions. So, all right, let's go up front and then in the back. Well, we can go back to front, I guess. Oh, sorry, just hang on, wait for the microphone. <laughs> My name is Rich Guffey, and the question is, with all the ongoing reforms continuing uh, across doctrine, policy, use, application, whatever, modernization, what are we not paying enough attention to that you think the Russians are doing well, and what do you think that they're going to they think they're doing well, that really they're not, and we should just let them do it. I call. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if I have to go first. <laughs> I invited, we invited you guys. No. Um, okay. Wait, were they not do well that we think that that they think they should they do well, and well, we should let them do it? That's a tough question, Rich. Am I going to say that? Because you're going to get me in trouble. You know this old joke, there's no problem with freedom of speech, the only problem is with freedom after speech. And I'm originally from the <laughs> Soviet Union, and you're not going to lead me out to that plank. Um, <laughs> that said, I mean, what I think th they are probably really doing increasingly well is actually arranging the force at the operational level and coming up with a way to basically field mixed combat formations and inter-service formations of maybe two types. One that's sort of more tactical operational, perhaps around the division with different types of units supporting it, and the other one really around the combined arms army, and they have different versions of it, they have started to really conceptualize their ex experience in Syria and basically seeing how an inter-service combat grouping could be affected and commanded, and then looking to see in the actual high-end fight in Europe how a combined arms army could form the core, the hub of this inter-service grouping, and then have air assets and other assets assigned to it. Um, and this is kind of, again, to me, in, in some ways, was, was a Garko's dream. But they're finally putting the pieces together, and they're finally really putting the pieces together for um, a, a way to add precision and to really see it at, at operational depths. The big problems we often have, right, when we talk about Russian military is technology fascists, we focus on the weapon capabilities, on the ranges and all that. The reality is that for the longest time, you know, Soviet Union always had this problem, we just couldn't see. It had great firepower, it had good ranges, but it couldn't see very well in most cases. And it couldn't, couldn't make use of a lot of that firepower, that's why it has so much area of effect. And the big change is that the Russian military increasingly really can see a tactical operational depths, and further out as the capabilities to certainly hit things, critical objects that don't move. And, and so it's adding, it's really adding force multipliers to what already is a fairly capable force in terms of firepower. That to me is interesting. 
The latter part are totally going to punt on, Rich. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm maybe the, this recon fire strike system that they're, that they're trying to develop this way of integrating fires, sensors, and computer technology. They seem to be making big advances with it. I mean, it, it's, uh, I think the system's called Strel. You can always hear it mentioned in their, uh, in their, uh, in their system. They, they, seem to be, they seem to be getting this, this concept right. They seem to be going down the right road. And in terms of the problem, I, th I think it's a logistics problem, not the logistics part of, of getting supplies up to the front, but the logistics part in, in, in large-scale combat operations to be able to sustain all this new technology that they're getting in. You know, they've got a lot of new technology, but uh, I, I don't know if, if they're going to be engaged in a large-scale combat operation, if, if the, how long they can sustain this technology. You know, a lot of stuff's going to be breaking down. Um, you know, it's not like the old Soviet days where you could just, you know, take the truck back and a couple guys could pull the engine out, put a new one, or put the transmission in. So a lot of this stuff has to go back, not just to the depot, but back to the original equipment manufacturer, and has to be uh, rebuilt there in order to be, you know, in order to be serviced. So I don't know if they have that kind of, of, of uh, you know, technological capability to keep that, to keep that large scale, you know, industrial production going on in the middle of large scale combat operations. Les? I would say what they do well is design equipment appropriate to their terrain. It's designed to fight and operate optimally on their terrain. And they're not being an expeditionary force, they don't have to build something that functions optimally in the desert, in the Arctic, in the jungle, et cetera, uh, as the same system. So. Okay, I'll take the one last question in the back. Uh, thank you, Mariusz Stus from the Polish Embassy here in DC. I have a, maybe a little bit uh, naive questions. Uh, when you look at this, uh, emerging force structure and uh, modernization process of uh, Russian uh, armed forces. Can you read uh, the intentions of Russians, whether they are purely defensive or whether there are some offensive elements? I'm not talking about the large scale uh, operations, but as Michael said, it's just small, smaller on the fringe of the, the, of the NATO or, or Russia. Thank you. I mean, I don't know any country that doesn't want better military capabilities or to spend your defense dollars better than they are. So, I mean, I, I, you know, even if there wasn't this current problem going on with uh, this tension going on between Russia and NATO right now, I think they, they would still be going through it and, and trying to improve a lot of these systems. But, uh, you know, as for intent, uh, obviously this, this impetus is this, this, current, uh, this current tension between NATO, but I, I don't know if you really discern a an intent less. Well, I, I just think if you look at Russia's history, they're surrounded by people who have come to see them uninvited. And they, uh, there's also, also people out there who've come long distances to uh, see them uninvited. And they have uh, perceived uh, that they are surrounded by hostile peoples. And this has got to affect how you look at the world. Uh, we haven't been invaded by Canada yet, um, though we've tried on the other side and failed four times. Uh, Mexico, yeah, well, Pancho Villa did come across in Columbus, New Mexico for a very short visit. That didn't turn out well for him. And got General Pershing down to visit for a while. And uh, Mexico's had a few problems with us, but. We don't have that same historic fear of our borders and what's coming at us next. And I think that has to have some impact on how you look at the world and how you perceive and your worldview. Okay. On that uh, note, I think that's a good place to end on. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, let's thank our speakers. <laughs>